financially fail. It's not about giving money to doctors. It's not about giving power to patients. It is about privatizing the National Health Service. They are going to break out the most cost-effective health service in the world and sell it off to the private sector. still be funded from taxation, but a greater and greater slice of that money would wind up in the pockets of private companies. That opportunity will amount to one trillion pounds over the next ten years. The Trust's own figures, and they're freely available, show that 50,000 staff, including Tens of thousands of frontline clinical staff will lose their jobs in these rounds of cuts at the moment. is a really important piece of the social fabric in this country and it's a mark actually of, of civilization to have healthcare free at the point of need and uh, it was a terrific achievement in 1948 that, that they had to fight for. It tackled the problem of the failed market that had existed in healthcare up until then which meant that 50% of the population found it difficult to afford healthcare. This was a network of mainly small hospitals uh, which didn't have any relationship one to the other in each area and made it impossible to carry out modern medicine that we've seen in the period since. Doctors who were around when the NHS started described women coming in on the first day with terrible conditions who had never gone to the doctor before because the money was spent on their children and their husbands, who were the breadwinners of course, when people got sick in the family. The NHS was obviously an expensive decision to take at that stage. For a whole period of time it lacked sufficient investment and particularly during the 1980s when Margaret Thatcher came into office there were three years in a row where actual spending on the NHS in real terms actually fell. The internal market originally started under John Major and that was really when they divided health care up into buyers and sellers instead of money being allocated to hospitals and then they had so much for a year and that was what they had to spend. By the time John Major was kicked out in 1997 you had a waiting list well over the million mark, people commonly waiting over two years for operations. What we've seen under Labour since 2000 is substantial increases year on year in spending. And things improved, no question about it. Waiting lists came down and patients' experience was good. But coupled with attempts by Labour and now of course being driven forward by the new government to give a greater share of that money to private providers. There's no reason for the shift from the public provision to the private provision and every time Private providers have been entered into the UK system back in the 80s and the PFIs that were introduced in the 90s. It's been very expensive. The PFI disaster, when we now found ourselves paying 60 something billion pounds, taxpayers' money, our money, for 11 billion pounds worth of hospitals. We're still seeing hospitals having to uh, cut services in order to make these payments to banks that are pocketing the profit. The first thing they have to do is to pay the PFI bill because they're actually obliged to do it under absolutely watertight contracts. Private finance initiative is one of the main avoidable costs of the situation in the NHS today. Any government that was serious about this would start first by renationalising PFI 
and ensure that no more of these nonsensical deals are signed. PFI is left completely intact by Andrew Lansley's bill. He doesn't even mention it. The politicians are trying to pretend the NHS is in a crisis with the sorts of things that they say, uh, no change is not an option. And we really have to challenge even that, because why is no change uh, not an option? Studies like the Commonwealth Fund study show that we have one of the most cost-effective healthcare systems in the world. Everybody's treated the same way. We have very good access to healthcare. Public satisfaction with the NHS was at its highest ever until recently, and these reforms started worrying everybody. And the report that showed that, of course, was not released by this government. The aim of the bill is competition and market, and to fundamentally undermine the basic values of the NHS. Clause 1 abolishes the duty of the Secretary of State to provide comprehensive universal health care. And the commissioning board set up to run the NHS also does not have a duty. If you remove the duty, then the NHS can actually begin to shrink. The next thing they're proposing to do is to sweep away all of the existing management structures of the NHS. And in their place, all the money is going to be delegated down to local groups of GPs. There's no requirement that they meet in public. There's no requirement that they consult local people on controversial changes they might be proposing. Most GPs will not want to do their own commissioning. They will hand that function to the private sector. And in that way, the, those private companies will finally get their hands on the NHS budget and they will be buying care from any willing provider under the new plans, which is also likely to be the private sector. Any willing provider who can satisfy the regulator, Monitor, that they meet certain criteria which are minimal because Monitor's brief is to maximise competition, any willing provider will be able to put in a bid to take over certain areas of healthcare. I was at the Select Committee on Health and Doyle actually questioned Monitor and said, so is it anti-competitive for an A&E? to have relationships with the departments in the hospital. And monitors said, well, probably. And if a local consortia wants to talk to its local NHS hospital about providing integrated care for diabetes or for strokes or anything like that, monitor may say, this is anti-competitive. You can't do it. You've got to allow anybody to provide stroke services or diabetes care. And they say to you, you can't have that treatment that you read about in the paper, or I'm not going to send you to hospital. I don't think, I don't think you need it or that intervention is too high risk for you, you will be thinking, are they saying that because they don't want to spend their consortium budget on me? Or are they sending me to the private clinic down the road rather than the NHS hospital because they've got an interest in it? And we know that something like 25% of GPs, it's reported, have a direct interest in the private sector. Now we already know the private sector in Britain doesn't want to deliver some areas of healthcare. They're not actually very interested in most mental health. They're not interested in accident and emergencies. They're not interested in anybody with any complex or chronic cases that are potentially expensive or risky to treat. They basically just want elective surgery that makes money and can guarantee them a profit. The problem is if you take money away from existing NHS providers for these core services, you leave them with all the more expensive cases and none of the potential areas where they might be able to balance the books and share the costs across different services. They are actually say that if departments of hospitals are shown to be failing, those departments should be shut. Now, I don't understand how an NHS hospital, and it will be an NHS hospital that has a 24-hour accident and emergency, can cope if its <coughs> orthopaedic service has failed and been closed. The government were talking to four different private companies about privatising aspects of the blood service. First of all, does it make any sense to break up a service which is working extremely well, but the concept that private companies can make profit out of something that hundreds of thousands of people in this country give for nothing is just disgusting. Graduates starting a GEM course in 2012 will not be able to access a student loan to cover the course fees for year one, despite the fact that they've nearly trebled to £9,000. The NHS student bursary, which covers course fees for years two to four and provides a means-tested maintenance grant, is now under review by the Department of Health and it might be removed. If the student bursary is removed, the price of a graduate medical degree will have gone from £3,375 to £36,000. Will we be able to go to these private companies for training and services that are no longer available in the NHS? There's already been rumours that GPs are becoming reluctant to take medical students because of the extra work that's going to come on board. It gets worse, right? It gets, it's even more. In addition, foundation trusts which are the freestanding businesses set up in 2003 by New Labour. What are foundation trusts? They're hospitals. 
Why are they called foundation trusts? Because they're not really part of the NHS anymore. They are businesses. They stand on their own two feet. They can go bust. They can borrow money. They can generate income. They can do what the bloody hell they like, so long as Monitor agrees. All existing NHS trusts, which are not yet foundations, either, either have to become foundations or be taken over by foundation trusts. But worse than that, foundation trusts are no longer to be capped in any way on the amount of money they can make from selling care to private patients. Obviously, as money gets harder and harder to make from treating NHS patients, they can bring in as many as they want, wealthy foreigners or wealthy people from around the country who want to jump the growing queues for treatment. And remember, all this only applies to England. In Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, they're lucky enough to have more democratic control over their health services, and none of this nonsense applies to them. If you look around the world, competitive healthcare systems are more expensive, less efficient and more dangerous actually for patients because there are greater numbers of accidents and there are greater problems in following up difficulties because that then generally is thrown back onto public sector providers. Companies are going to come in promising that they can deliver things at a cheaper price than someone else and drive down the quality of what they're actually doing. And part of that, of course, will be done on health service staff. When hospital cleaning is outsourced, fewer staff, lower wages, hospital infections, uh, to the point where it got so bad that they've had to bring it back in-house again. Everywhere a hospital is threatened with cuts, job losses and cuts in service provision, we have to do this again and again and again. It's our NHS and we're going to fight for it. There's a big challenge, of course, at the moment, which is to save £20 billion over the next four years, and it's already been conceded that no healthcare system in the world has ever been able to save that amount of money. But what politicians won't even face up to and admit is that by buying and selling healthcare, they have added enormously to the bureaucratic costs of the NHS. You've got to have lawyers, you've got to have contracting out, you've got to have fraud and advertising and all that sort of thing. By just removing the market in healthcare in this country, which was the way it used to be before they introduced the internal market, we could be saving at least £10 billion a year. Now that's twice as much as we're having to save at the moment through cuts and closures, loss of frontline jobs and all the rest of it. But because of their ideological commitment to bringing in the private sector and the marketisation of healthcare, um, they will not admit that or consider that as a solution to saving money. There is no joined up explanation of how any of these efficiency savings can be achieved. And this means that, you know, for us working in the hospital, you get given a target of how much money your department is going to save. And the euphemism savings is what they use. It's cuts. It's cuts in the services that we provide. Sir, Nick and David love the bankers. We think they're a load of wankers. Tory tops, no ifs, no buts, no public sector cuts. We're losing staff and that means that waiting lists will be longer, our thresholds will be higher. So if our thresholds get higher, um, by the time we get to see um, these children and families, obviously their problems will be more serious and more chronic. So, you know, the chances of us doing any early intervention, you know, preventative work, are nil really, basically. They're taking out almost all the comes practitioners. Um, so, and there's going to be very few clinicians available, but the demand for the service hasn't gone down. One in five children in Lewisham live in poverty with the associated stress that this brings to children and their families. The government's No Health Without Mental Health strategy, only a few months old, emphasises the importance of early intervention for children who have mental health difficulties. We've had a report done by the London School of Economics that says it makes economic sense for early intervention in child mental health. I don't know who's made this decision, I don't know why they've made it, not a single GP in Lewisham knows about this decision. So much for GP commissioning. We have to get rid of this government because it's going to devastate our NHS. Health cut! No way! Connaught Day Hospital! Here's a stay! Health cut! No way! Connaught Day Hospital! Here's a stay! I've worked there for eight years. 
The service is second to none for the elderly. There's very little out there in Waltham Forest. Charities are losing their money, they're losing their grants. There's nothing for these elderly, unwell, lonely people out there. There's very little and they deserve so much better. A facility like this can, in the end, save the NHS money because it's actually keeping people out of hospital as well as being a humane institution and meaning that uh, people can get their care and treatment in, in one place rather than their provision being fragmented. South West Essex is the most extreme example so far, because there's more still to come, of primary care trusts that have drawn up a very extensive list, in their case 213 different treatments and operations that are no longer routinely provided by the NHS and paid for by the NHS. And these include knee replacements, hip replacements, almost all IVF treatments, other than for recovering cancer patients. Patients needing those type of treatments are effectively being told, you have a choice, you can go with that or you can go private. But the NHS is not going to be supplying that need anymore. Other than hospital, everyone is just complaining that they just haven't got enough staff to do the job. Porters have been cut to the bone, so we've got wards ringing up saying, can you take someone for x-ray, and there's no one there to do it. The only way the wards can cope with that is to send one of the ward staff from the ward to go and take the patient for an x-ray. The problem is there aren't then enough staff left on the ward to do the job they require to do. The Primary Care Trust also decided to have a freeze for 12 weeks on all outpatient activity unless it was emergencies. There are 5,000 people that have been caught by this locally. Waiting lists have suddenly ballooned. They've literally just been cutting little services in order that they can end up with a balance sheet that says we've cut 50 million quid. There's one down in Thurrock in South Essex that gives support for mums to encourage them to do more breastfeeding. Fantastically successful project, tiny amount of money, 50,000 quid a year, they've cut that. They've cut a million pounds from the HIV budget. At the meeting where they took these decisions on cuts, they were warned by a consultant in the meeting that if you make these cuts, people will die because these are the drugs that keep them alive and they're still nodded through a £1 million cut on the £6.5 million budget. 21 PCTs have informed charities such as the Terence Diggings Trust and Gay Men Fighting Aid. There is no money to fund you, only six months at a time, because of 43% cuts. I heard David Cameron say, I love the NHS. Well, Mr Cameron, we love it more and you ain't getting it! Yes! Yes! High class healthcare for the masses! Not just for the ruling classes! High class healthcare for the masses! Not just for the ruling classes! High class healthcare for the masses! Not just for the ruling classes! NHS, not for sale! NHS, not for sale! When health workers lose their fear, when that anger turns into confidence, they can do anything. And that's what I see today. It reminds me very much of a period that happened at UCH between 91 and 95. Walls closing, hospitals closing, schools of nurses closing, nursing staff pissed off about no confidence. A ward was closed without any consultation and then it blew. We voted for a strike to support an occupation of the ward where the nurses continued to nurse the patients, where the patients refused to move from the ward. And our porters linked arms across the entrance of the ward to stop the management removing the patients. At night, the A&E staff would bleat the union to ask them, which ward are we putting the patients on? And we finally won this dispute with the support of the doctors. In the 70s, there was a wave of hospitals threatened with closure. Those hospitals were occupied. The Elizabeth Garrett Anderson was kept open. A lot of the level of organisation in the NHS now has suffered because the union has sought to have a relationship with Labour, demobilise its activists. A lot of the leadership think that the only way that you can defend a hospital is by having a government in that's sympathetic to you. The Health Worker Network is an alliance of BMA, RCN, Unite, Unison, radiographers, physiotherapists, trying to give confidence to people to start fighting, perhaps like we did in the 1990s at UCH.
once we get some groups of people prepared to take action, that will encourage other people to do the same thing. It's going to come, but I think it's just overcoming that lack of confidence which is there at the moment. Health workers will always get backing from the public and from other trade unions. In 1982 there were strikes of uh, pay, which led to perhaps the biggest general strike of workers since 1926 in support of health workers. If you look at the Whittington Hospital, their A&E department was threatened with closure last year. And although the health workers didn't have the confidence, their community had a demonstration of 5,000 people, which is the biggest demonstration outside of Central London Teaching Hospital ever. Cuts to the advocacy service at the Homerton Hospital. 300 strong demonstration of health workers outside that hospital led to the backing off of some of the worst excesses of that cuts. There was a threat in East London Mental Health Trust to cut by 8% the bank rates for nurses working on the bank. The union straight away threatened to go into dispute and that threat has been withdrawn. At the end of the day, if we're going to be leading some direct action within the hospital, it has to be health workers, nurses, doctors, um, healthcare assistants. They're the ones who are going to have to lead this. As they did when speech therapists struck in South London, they actually managed to get the cuts in their sector reduced. We support children with communication difficulties in schools. If children don't get that support, they're much more likely to run into real problems or become socially isolated at school. If a child's not able to express needs or give an opinion or access the curriculum at school or sometimes teaching staff might need a bit of extra support understanding that child. But it's more than just kind of their, their speech or their, their sound production. In detention centres or prison, a huge proportion of young people have speech and language disorders or needs or a disability like autism which hasn't been picked up. If that had been recognised much earlier on, those kids hopefully would have stood a bit of a chance to have more choices available to them. The decision to strike wasn't necessarily an easy one, but I think we were just a bit sick and tired of all being kind of nice people, just making do with what has been dealt to us. We made sure that there were no compulsory redundancies or voluntary redundancies, and we managed to protect the service and protect people's jobs. We held a rally which had about 150 people coming to it, health workers and members of the public, and yet the support that we had was really fantastic. What I've taken away from all of this was just how reassured we were by the amount of public support that we had behind us. And I think that actually gave a lot of strength to our message. Um, and I wouldn't hesitate to suggest to other healthcare workers at different agencies to, to do the same. High class healthcare for the masses! Not just for the ruling classes! Unite and unison need to call a national demonstration. All the trade unions now have to get behind the NHS because this is our NHS and it's NHS values that are under threat. Ideally I'd like to see a national strike over the health service. In 1988 nurses in Manchester went on strike and won over special duty payments. A few people met in a room in London and decided that we were going to do something about Thatcher's attacks on the health service. There were strikes particularly of student nurses across London, which then led to the unions calling national strike action and probably the best pay rise for nurses that there's ever been. That dispute wasn't just about pay though, it really was about the state of the National Health Service. The health service is something that you could unite the entire community around the opposition to the Lansley bills and the cuts and hopefully fragment this awful coalition government at the same time. I think the message has to go out to the politicians that the public simply won't tolerate this and that this will become the coalition's poll tax if they don't pull back from it. Over 30 locations across the country today People in their local communities are occupying banks and transforming them into NHS services as far north as Aberdeen, as far south as Plymouth. It's not the NHS that needs reform, it's the banks. Black Jack,